The title is, As for Me, I'll Call on God. You're going to be hearing this phrase throughout the sermon, so much so that you're going to be repeating it out loud when I ask you to participate. But we all know that God provides miracles. That is indeed true. And we read numerous examples where God did just that in situations that were humanly impossible. Humanly impossible to solve, but only God could provide. Now what is it that only God can do? When God has a plan, he makes sure his plan will be fulfilled, and he chooses certain individuals to fulfill his plan. He doesn't ask them, yet he expects them to obey. And God is not going to give up on those people either. And even though God chose certain individuals to carry out his plans, not everyone wanted to obey, coming up with all kinds of excuses, trying to run away, or even wanting to end their lives, feeling it was just too much of a task to carry out. Why me? This is too much for me. How can I do this? Out of all the people you could have asked, why me? Have someone else do it. Now we know this is Moses' response when he was commanded to go back to Pharaoh to free God's people, the Israelites, who were also Moses' people when he found out what the truth was and then fled Egypt. God made it clear to Moses that he would be with them to guide and direct everything he was supposed to do through the miracles that God would perform. And when Moses did then lead the people out of Egypt, and here they were, first of all, they're all excited to leave Egypt, all the Israelites, but now they're at the Red Sea with nowhere to go. And then the distance saw the Egyptian soldiers and their chariots, and the people complained, putting pressure on Moses, even telling him that they were better off in Egypt What did Moses do? Well, he called on God. And God answered, saying this in Exodus 14, verses 1 through 4. Exodus 14, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before Piharioth between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land, the wilderness has closed them in. So Pharaoh saw a victory on his side, thinking also, oh, God's not going to save him, we win. Of all the plagues, of all the things that God already showed to Pharaoh, how he is obviously more powerful. But quick did Pharaoh forget, but also the Israelites. Verse 4, then I will harden the Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. See, again, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. So many times he already had done this. And of course, again, this was up to God to decide what to do. There was a purpose all behind this anyway. Continuing in verse 9, the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Paharioth before Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, behold, the Egyptians marched after them, so they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Ah, how quickly they forgot what they endured for so many years in Egypt. And here they're finally free, but not really as they thought in their hearts. Verse 12, is this, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. 
So Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Obviously, before this, Moses is already praying because pretty much by himself here in this situation. What am I going to do? I'm going to ask God to help me. Verse 14, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The, Egypt, the Israelites didn't have to do anything. God was going to take care of this. Verse 15, Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Of course, Moses is pleading to God for help. And Moses tells, uh, God tells Moses exactly what to do. Verse 15 or 16, I'm sorry, but lift your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. They shall follow them. See, God had a plan the whole time of what was going to happen. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians, verse 18, shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. As for Moses, he called on God. God provided. And God called on Moses to fulfill his plan. And when they were in the wilderness, so after all this, okay, did the Israelites then finally recognize and see that this is indeed God who saved them, who will always save them? Once again, they were in the wilderness, and they're hungry and thirsty, and they're complaining to Moses again and again when nothing seemed possible to a human standpoint. Again, what did Moses do? God provided over and over again. But there comes a time when God has had enough. And I'm not going to go into that any further, but we all know the story, and we all know what, what God did to wake up the Israelites and to show them over and over again. And we see this in the world anyway. But for another example, we God called on Noah, um, Noah for a specific task, building an ark, because God would destroy the world with a flood. And we heard about this in the prior message by Mr. Gale. And see how Noah answered his call. And after the flood subsided and they left the ark, he called on God in Genesis 8 by responding with thanks. Now, do we sometimes forget after God provides to thank God for providing? Well, Noah did just that by making a, a burnt or building an offer and providing burnt offerings to God which God obviously accepted. And God then also made a promise to a rainbow as a sign that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. And God had blessed Noah and his sons. This was very important because Noah and his family were the only people on the earth at that point. So God had to bless Noah and his sons to have them being fruitful and multiplying the earth. David, a man after God's own heart, was chosen by God to be king in Samuel 16. And David, as we all know, went through a lot in life. He made a lot of mistakes. But he always pleaded to God for mercy and forgiveness, and he always prayed to him. No matter what the situation was, no matter wherever he messed up in life, he always looked to God and he... He needed that. He needed that forgiveness, needed that mercy from him. He needed the help from God. What did David do during his most difficult times? Notice Psalm 55. In beginning verse 1. Psalm 55, verse 1. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint and moan noisily because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they bring down trouble upon me, and in wrath they hate me. 
My heart is severely pained within me, or pained within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Verse 9, destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls. Iniquity and trouble are also in the midst of it. Destruction is in its midst. Oppression and deceit do not depart from its streets. For it is not an enemy who approaches me, then, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from him. Verse 13, but it was you, a man, my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. Let death seize them, let them go down alive into hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Verse 16, the key scripture. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Out of all the things that were going on in his life, he took that very personal. This is what I'm going to do. This is not what they're going to do. Or who cares what they're going to do? But this was the point for him personally. As for me, I'm going to call on God. And then he was confident because in the very next verse, or very next saying, and the Lord shall save me. He knew that it was going to happen. And what does he do continuously in verse 17? Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud. This was a continuous thing. The whole book of Psalms are all prayers to God. He did this continuously. It never stopped. When we don't have an answer, do we stop after a few times? It's like, ah, you know what? God made his answer. No, we keep going. He shall hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. The first 15 verses, we read about David laying out all the problems that he wants God to hear and to solve and to answer. And now, after verse 16, here is how God is answering his prayer. Verse 19, God will hear and afflict them, even he who abides from old. Because they do not change, therefore they do not fear God. He has put forth his hands against those who were at peace with them. He has broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. Now, I mean, in a sense, he's talking to us here. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. He called to God several times, also in Psalm 17, verse 6, where he said, Psalm 17, verse 6, I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. <clears throat> also chapter 86 and verse 7. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you will answer me. And also in chapter 120 and verse 1. In my distress, I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. He always had the same response. God heard me. God's going to answer me. Another well-known example we often refer to is in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 12. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 12, speaking about Daniel's three friends. If you know who, know who that is, let's chatter like Meshach and Abednego. So Daniel chapter 3 and verse 12, beginning, we read, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs to the province of Babylon, the three, 
And these men, O king, have not paid due regards to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. So here, of course, a decree that the, that the king at the time had put together and everyone was supposed to observe this, but of course they refused. Verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring the three Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying to them, is it true? that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up. And in verse 15, now if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn and all the things that, that are in here and you fall down, worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is this God who will deliver you from my hands? Well, what was their response? There's the only three out of all the people that would not do what the king wanted to do. But as for me, I'll call on God. So here's what they said in verse 16. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But, verse 18, if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. See, they felt calm and confident no matter what was going to happen. They had a full trust in God. Can we respond in that way if that were ever to happen to us? Can we be that calm and confident that God is going to save us no matter what happens? Another example, after stealing and deceiving his father into giving him the blessing that was meant for Esau, he fled. That's Jacob, fled after being away from home for years. And then he finally headed back home. And once he heard his brother Esau was coming to meet him, he was very afraid. But what did Jacob do? Though Jacob had grown and matured in a lot of ways over the years, he was now forced to face the consequences of his sins. And we notice this in Genesis chapter 32 and verses 9 through 12. Genesis chapter 32 in verse 9, Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, verse 11, I pray from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Yes, Jacob was afraid, but he also remembers the promise that God had given him. Yet again, he put this into God's hands. You know, obviously, his humility had, ex had increased over time, looking to God for help as he was coming to his conversion. Now, throughout his life, Jacob was used to dealing with his problems. Or he used, <laughs> go back, Jacob was used to dealing with his problems by running away from them. But now he had a choice to make. Would he continue running? Or would he finally now trust in God who would pull through for him despite his many mistakes? He chose to turn to God despite his many flaws. God still chose him for something special. God had a plan for Jacob all along. And it took fighting and literally wrestling with God to submit and trust him. And he was then blessed and had his name changed to Israel. For he struggled with God and with men and had prevailed, as we read about in Genesis 32, verses 28 and 29. In Mark 5, we read about a large crowd 
that had gathered around Jesus. <clears throat> People from all over the region had rushed to him, pressed against him. And in this crowd was a young woman who had been suffering from chronic bleeding for 12 years. She had visited many doctors and had spent all she had on treatments. But instead of getting better, her condition worsened. And because of the nature of her illness, she was considered unclean according to the laws and traditions at that time. She was sick. She pretty much was pretty much an outcast since no one could heal her. But you know what? I didn't stop her. What did she do? She said to herself, no one can help me. But as for me, I'll call on God. And because of her confident faith in Jesus, she was able to ignore the pain for that moment and ultimately take the risk that had changed her life. Notice Mark 5, verse 27. Mark chapter 5, beginning verse 27. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of affliction. Verse 30, Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you, and you said, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. Verse 33, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. You know, even though she was already healed, Christ still wanted to see a little bit more from her. Obviously, she was very thankful for it, and she had the faith that she would be healed. You know, Christ also prayed to his Father constantly for strength and comfort to all the temptations that he went through which he knew he had to overcome since he also knew what his purpose was going to be. And it was God's will that he would have to die for mankind. And he also knew that. And he prayed to God. Nevertheless, still prayed to him to let that cup pass over him, but also acknowledged that it was God's will and not Christ's. We should be praying the same exact way for God's will to be done. It is indeed challenging. But here is our greatest example, Jesus Christ, that we should be imitating. Now, what about, uh, what about us? Have we been in situations like these where we had to put everything in God's hands, knowing that only he could help us when man could not? Now, you heard about a little bit about the COVID pandemic announcements and what a tragedy and a mess that was. Well, but during this COVID pandemic, the world changed and the leaders didn't really know how to cope with it, going to all sorts of extremes and measures to pretty much shut the world down. Have we truly recovered from COVID? Has the world truly recovered from COVID? No, it has not. And you can see that with everything that's going on even to this day. But still, during that time, travel was affected, relationships were affected, not being able to see loved ones, the church of God was affected. So how did we cope with it? On a personal level, how did I cope with it? Starting in 2019 and into 2020, travel was grounded. And this was definitely a time of uncertainty. Now, when I started to got, get to know my wife, it was in Germany in the spring of 2019, during a Days of Lamb bread. And then we saw each other again at the feast in 2019 in Germany. 
And then COVID hit. That was the last time we saw each other. I tried to visit her twice in Spain, because that's where she was living. But I couldn't do that because of travel ban. I wasn't able to be there for her when her father died in February of 2020. I was supposed to go to Germany again uh, during the Days of Lemon Bread in April. And then planning on visiting, uh, visiting her in Spain. Of course, that didn't happen. She was planning on coming here in the summer of that year, but still couldn't get a flight. And in the meantime, I at least applied for my naturalization because I wasn't a citizen yet in April of 2020. Because one thing I did know, what was going to happen is I was going to marry her. I knew that as a, for a fact, eventually, right? And we would finally see each other, but once again, it was all in God's hands. So finally, an opportunity came in September of 2020 for her to come to the United States when the travel ban had been lifted, but she would have to quarantine for 14 days in a third country. And there was a list of acceptable countries on that travel list. And her mom would accompany her as well. When they had traveled or decided to travel to Dominican Republic, thinking that was going to be a nice 14-day vacation there. But of course, during COVID, there was a lot of things that were not going on. So it, virtually everything was still in shutdown mode. But at least that was the opportunity she could do uh, to travel there first to come here. And so finally, after 321 days of not seeing each other, they arrived in San Diego on September 11th. And she was able to be here for my 40th birthday. I missed two of hers uh, shortly after that. And then we got married on September 24th, 2020. And then we were able to come to the feast or go to the feast here in the United States. Now, of course, the question is, did God have a hand in this? Well, it took a lot of patience. It took a lot of long distance relationship. It felt like I was a teenager or whatever going through this, uh, but having that much time go by. And that was the window of opportunity for her to come. And shortly after her being here, travel of ban was again put into place when another wave of COVID hit in the winter, making it uh, difficult for travel once again to occur when flights were canceled and so on. But at least she was here and we were together However, she was not able to go back to Germany or she wasn't able to go back to Spain either to see her family. And due to all the delays of me finally getting naturalized, which didn't happen until July of 2022, so two years after I applied, and then immediately then applied for her green card in August of that year, as you know, she finally received her green card last week in the mail without an interview, which was a huge relief and truly a miracle from God. Since September of 2020, we had not been able to travel internationally, but we didn't give up. We prayed every day. We put in God's hands. We did everything we could do, and the rest was up to him. It was up to his time. And of course, we knew, we knew that God would intervene but we just didn't know when. And now God answered, and we can finally make plans to once again go to Germany for Days of Lemon Bread in April as a plan, which, interestingly enough, is three and a half years of waiting since she's been here. And then she finally go back to Spain to see her family, and I get to meet them now for the first time. You know, again, we knew that God would answer our prayers, but we just didn't know when. Does that not sound familiar? Do we not all do the same thing, eagerly waiting for the return of Christ, not knowing exactly when it will be, but we know that he will come? And we don't quit. We continue praying. We continue to call on God. And 
since we have the understanding of knowing this in the Bible, there are unfortunately many who call on God, but God is not going to hear them. And why is that? It's known as Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 10. Disciples came to Christ and said, Why do you speak to these people in parables? And Christ said, he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. To you, meaning the people who are called. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Verse 13, therefore I speak to them in perils, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. The words are here in the Bible. We are reading them right now. And yet, people don't understand what this even means. Amazing how God opens the minds of those who he calls and has them shut for those who don't. But so many people don't realize it. Because there are many who think they are called. But they're not. Notice Matthew 7, 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. How can you go on living a life of sin and then expect to be saved and understand this calling? Not yet. Not at this time. But there is a specific group of people who God has called. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 26, First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. In the eyes of people in the world who are considered powerful, they look at us as foolish and weak things and the base things of this world. That's a point God's trying to make here. The base things, verse 28, of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to another the things that are. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Also notice 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We call on God when we are in need. We call on him at any time for anything. He does hear us. Even if we think at times he doesn't. Years could go by before he intervenes, as we have heard about in the examples I have given. But everything is according to his plan to his timeline, to his will. We keep asking, we wait on him, and through our efforts, he will provide our efforts. There is still something we are to do. Praying is one of them. But he looks in our hearts, he looks at the efforts that we provide. But he also has called us to have a relationship with him, as we see in John chapter 6 and verse 44. 
This is also part of our effort. John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then further in chapter 10, and verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. We have this opportunity to do just that, and we are in good hands. Those who do not believe and are not called can't have the same opportunity we have, as it says in the previous verses in verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Verse 26 but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Do we not see how vital it is to stick with God and not forsake him? Peter makes that very clear in 2 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12. 2 Peter 1, in verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. If so, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What are one of the things we, the church, should be doing? You should all know the answer to this, but... Of course, it is always important to revisit it in 2 Timothy 4 and verses 2 through 5. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. This applies to anybody, not just people in the world. No, this applies to everyone, even within the church. These are warnings for each and every one of us. It's happened before. It will happen again. We lift up our voice like a trumpet. Like it says in Isaiah 58.1. We don't hold back. We do not quit. This is what God expects of us. We warn the world of what is coming. Yes, we live in a a world that is ruled by Satan. We have the responsibility to not be a part of this world. Because we know that the world is going to be judged based on its deeds. Notice Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14. Now read to verse 18. Uh, Verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and it hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. Ah, the mighty men of the world. Here they are in a situation where there's nothing they can do about it. And they're going to cry out. Verse 15, the day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. Verse 17, I will bring distress upon men. They shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like refuse. And verse 18, 
Neither their silver nor their gold. They can add their money. They can add possessions, whatever it may be. Shall be able to deliver them. In the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. God is not a fan of having his law broken. And he is a jealous God when it comes to that. God commands everybody to worship him. And yet they don't. And that is why we are in the state we are in. And it's going to get worse, as we hear about all the time, every week in the current events. You know, if we stay true in our faith to God by also putting on God's character, then this is what he expects of us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer." Yes, we are suffering for this. This is not an easy life that we are living. It's not easy at all to live God's way of life in this world ruled by Satan. We are suffering so we can obtain eternal life and to be in God's kingdom. And verse 6, since it is a righteous thing which God, or with God, to repay, repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled Rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. We see how God takes care of us. And we know that no trial will be too overbearing for us that we couldn't control. And overtake us as it says in 1 Corinthians 10.13. We have to keep watching, we have to keep praying, so we will be counted worthy and to be spared for what is coming, like we read here, which we also read in Luke chapter 21, in verses 34 through 36. Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, with drunkenness, with cares of this life, with all distractions in this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore, verse 36, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. We know it's coming, it says it right here. We just don't know exactly when it's going to happen, like we were saying before. But we're very confident, obviously, that Christ is going to return. Confident knowing what is, what is going to happen in this world. But we do exactly what he says here, what God is telling us to do. And God the Father, and only God the Father, will make the decision of when Christ will return. Mark 13, verse 32. Mark 13 and verse 32, take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house, gave authority to his servants and to each of his work, and commanded doorkeeper to watch. I read a little further. Well, I wanted to read uh, verse 32 first. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, if, if even Jesus Christ doesn't even know when he's returning, and only God the Father does, why do we waste our time trying to figure out when exactly Christ is going to return? As so many people have done, and still try to figure it out. When it's blatantly stated right here in the Bible, that we are wasting our time trying to do that. That's not supposed to be our focus 
A warning is also expressed in Ezekiel 33. For those who do not take action when they hear this warning. I'd like to end with this warning. Ezekiel, or with a scripture in Ezekiel 33, and beginning verse 1. Speaking, of course, of a future time. Let me read again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees a sword coming upon the land, if he blows a trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, verse 5, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes warning will save his life. This is talking about a physical protection as well from that day of wrath. Verse 6, but if the watchman sees a sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. That is why we in the church have such a strong and important responsibility to warn the people of what is coming. We do this. Not everybody will respond, but we are doing everything we can be doing, and the rest is up to God. Those of us who will hear the trumpet sound and take action will be saved. As for me, I'll call on God, because only he will be able to protect us. So no matter what the situation we are in, Whatever trial that we are going through, know that we are not alone and all our troubles and worries and doubts and concerns that we face with on a daily basis, we can place all of that before God in our prayers and we have to have the faith and the trust for him to help us. And then we will see how he will answer. <laughs>